All right, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're going to be presenting our 4020 practicum project, uh, Spinnick Lake, a strategic management plan for protecting natural area. Uh, to my right, you have Emily Herb, Sarah Jardine, I'm Cody Weston, and in the audience, we have Joel Richardson and Emily Blake. Uh, so just a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about today. So I'm going to go over what a PNA is, uh, a little bit of background on our protected natural area, Spendick Lake, and what our focus has been throughout the project, and that's water, invasives, and fire. Um, we've worked for the past year with the Department of Energies and Resource Development, ERD. Uh, they gave us a copy of their draft for the strategic manager plan of Spendick Lake. Uh, we went through that and looked to see what, uh, what we could do to enhance uh, the draft. Uh, we went through using their flowchart. So purpose of a PNA, goals of a strategic plan, identify the threats and the strengths of the PNA, and look at objectives and strategies to mitigate those threats. Um, the three goals again are minimize human induced impacts, restore altered habitats, minimize impacts of potential large scale disturbances. All right, so what is a PNA? I'm going to do a little bit of the legalese definition here. So that's a clearly defined geographical space, recognized, dedicated, and managed through legal or other effective means uh, to achieve a long-term conservation uh, of nature with associated ecosystem services and cultural values. So the PNA Act was established in 2003 to designate and protect areas of land or water representative of New Brunswick's ecosystems and biodiversity. Uh, so far, 202 PNAs have been established within New Brunswick totaling 273,700 hectares, that's 4.5% of the New Brunswick's land base. Uh, these are further designated into Class 1 and Class 2 designations, but before I get into that, just a quick overview of the New Brunswick. So on the map there, I have in the green just the crown lands owned by the province, the beige is the private lands, and the oranges are the PNA throughout New Brunswick. Circle in red is our PNA, Spednick Lake. So looking at uh, the classifications, so class one is all activities are prohibited. Uh, you're not to walk in there, you're not to go collect berries, no natural resource development, nothing. It's a strictly no access area. Um, our PNA though is designated as a class two. So recreational use having minimal environmental impacts is allowed. Uh, birding, uh, uh, slight like berry collection, uh, walking around, those kind of activities, just low impact activities are a-okay. Again, no resource development, no heavy duty machinery in there, anything like that. Um, for enforcement, it's enforced through forest officers, uh, and there's penalties associated with that. So fees and uh, possibly in imprisonment. So fines are up to $10,000, and imprisonment terms can be up to six months, depending on the severity of the offense. So a little bit about Spednick Lake. It was designated in 2003 when the PNA Act came into being. It's 25,726 hectares of land. It's, on, it's the second largest PNA within the province. Uh, it's on the western side of the province, just north of Macau. It's part of the St. Croix watershed, so it has a lot of water bodies feeding into it. Uh, it borders Maine, and it's partially regulated by the International Joint Commission. And uh, one of the unique features of our uh, protected natural area is the large body of water, which the Spendic Lake, which the PNA gets its namesake after. And with that, I'll hand it off to Sarah, who will be talking to you about water management. Okay. <clears throat> so proper water management is an essential part of the strategic management plan for Spednik Lake. Uh, maintaining healthy aquatic ecosystems mean you need, <coughs> need to maintain um, healthy water quality as well as maintaining good water levels. Um, maintaining the quality and levels of the water for ecosystems means that you can maintain the habitat for the diverse biodiversity of aquatic and terrestrial species that are found within the PNA. And this PNA is also used recreationally, so management in that sense is also important. We identified three major potential threats to the water within the PNA, and this includes degradation of water quality, the fluctuation <coughs> sorry, of water levels, and the introduction of aquatic invasives. Now we've outlined three goals associated with these threats, and that includes minimizing the impacts of pollution, improving the regulated water level fluctuations, and reducing the risk of the introduction of aquatic invasives. I'm now going to go into more detail about the first two threats that are highlighted on the screen. So a little background as to the threat that, that is posed to the water quality within the PNA. We have the McAdam Wastewater Treatment Plant, which is located about 20 minutes away from Spednik Lake. It's highlighted in yellow on the screen. The effluent discharge, meaning the water that this plant outputs, can make its way through two lakes and it drains into Spendnick Lake through Diggity Stream, 
which is indicated by the blue arrow on the map. We also only have baseline water quality monitoring that happens about every six years within the entire PNA, and there's only one site that offers comprehensive water quality testing, and that's at the Forest City site, which I'm going to show you on a map on the next slide. So we have identified a couple solutions to help reduce the chances of water quality degradation, and that would be to include a new monitoring site near where the location that the effluent discharge from the treatment plant um, comes through Diggity Stream and flows into Spednik Lake. Um, that's highlighted by the purple box on the map. We also have the Forest City Station, which is already established, and that's highlighted by red. Um, that station is, monitor, is regulated and run by Environment Canada, so having a new uh, monitoring station on the other side of the lake would provide more water quality on, the, on opposite ends, so we would be more apt to find degradating concentrations of parameters within the lake. We would also like to see an increase in the frequency and intensity of water quality sampling. So we'd like to see it improve from six years to two and from baseline, which only monitors for a handful of parameters, to comprehensive, which monitors for 39. This would ensure that any harmful concentrations of anything within the PNA are being found more frequently and we can deal with that on a faster basis. Um, a little background as to why the water fluctuations are a potential threat to the PNA. We have two impoundment dams, uh, one at Forest City, which is located on the left of the screen, and one at Vanceboro Dam, which is located on the right. The Vanceboro Dam poses a greater threat to the PNA as this is the dam that regulates the impoundment water of Spednik Lake. So it, it's the one that regulates how high and how low Spednik Lake goes. This dam is operated by Woodland Pulp, and they run it based on the legal level and flow requirements set by the International Joint Commission. Some of the negative effects that are associated with these water level fluctuations include increased or decreased shoreline erosion, changes or degradation to the habitat and spawning grounds of certain fish species, and degradation to the quality of water within the entire PNA. We have outlined a couple solutions to decrease the chances or the, de the threats of the water level fluctuations, and uh, that would be to have Canada and New Brunswick create their own legal level and flow requirements. As, as of right now, the International Joint Commission is, is the only one that sets the legal level and flow requirements within the PNA. So having Canada and New Brunswick set these requirements would ensure quality habitat and spawning grounds for various fish species. And looking at two species in particular for spawning sites, we have the smallmouth bass and landlocked salmon. Now smallmouth bass need, they like to spawn in gravel-like substrate and that's indicated by the green arrows on the screen. And salmon also like gravel-like substrate, but they also need swift moving currents, which is indicated by the red arrows on the screen. The International Joint Commission has set a minimum reservoir level for the water at 113 meters. Smallmouth bass need a minimum of, of 117, so therefore this does not provide them with quality spawning sites. So ensuring that we have legal requirements set on the Canadian and New Brunswick side would ensure these habitats and spawning grounds for those species. I'm now gonna move into the threat of the introduction of invasive aquatics. And um, just a little background, we've got a large diversity of fish species. 44 have been recorded within the St. Croix watershed and 36 of those happen within the PNA. We decided to look at three of the main sought out species by anglers that use uh, the protected natural area for fishing. Um, the, in, the introduction of invasive aquatics pose a major threat to the diversity of fish species. They establish very quickly. They have no natural predators. And once they're established, they're extremely hard to eradicate. I've listed here five of the top main concern um, invasive species for New Brunswick, and they're listed there at the bottom of the screen. 
These introductions can happen through accidental introductions, so carried on watercraft and equipment of people coming into the water bodies within the PNA, as well as illegal introductions, which was seen with smallmouth bass a um, couple years ago. Some of the solutions that we've come up with to reduce the risk of invasive aquatics would be to make the check clean dry method mandatory for all PNA users. This method is you check your watercraft and your equipment for any large debris, you rinse it down with a saline solution, and you let it dry for 24 hours before putting it in the water. We would like to couple that with when people get their boat registered, that they can get a sticker for aquatic hitchhikers. This would educate the people using the PNA so that they're aware of the dangers of the spread and the introduction of aquatic invasives. We would also like to see angler logbooks mandatory for anyone coming in to fish within the PNA. This would allow ERD to have current fish population surveys um, and it would allow them to be aware of any introductions or spread of these invasive species. I'm gonna now hand over the stage to Emily and she's gonna talk to you about plant and insect invasives. So one of the most important things that we did notice within the strategic management plan draft is the fact that there's currently no protocol in place for terrestrial invasive species. So to start us off, we utilize the New Brunswick Invasive Species Council field guide on the most or of the current species of concern to New Brunswick. And from these, we've chosen four plant species and two insect species to look at in detail and analyze the risk factor to the PNA. So this includes purple loosestrife, common reed, glossy buckthorn shown on the top left, and then garlic mustard on the top right. And for insects, we, we have looked at brown spruce longhorn beetle and emerald ash borer shown on the bottom respectively. So some background, um, common characteristics of invasives, some of which Sarah did mention, include rapid growth, high seed production and dispersal, the utilization of multiple habitat types, uh, strong competitive effort with native species, uh, the lack of natural enemies, as Sarah did mention, as well as adaptations to stress and resistance to mortality. The enemy release hypothesis, which is based upon the introduction of species to a new area, states that after an introduction, there tends to be a general lack of natural predators from the previous range. And this leads to a, ri a rise in abundance and dispersal from this species. Um, due to the lack of uh, natural predation, the uh, resources used for defense mechanisms can then be reallocated to increase growth and hardiness of the species. And this in turn uh, contributes to the establishment and further spread of the invasives. So we've outlined three potential threats for, inv for terrestrial invasives, including the alteration and degradation of physical environment, the loss of biodiversity, as well as high costs associated with the establishment of species. Our goals that we have here are include identifying pathways and areas of risk, implementing educational programs, as well as implementing monitoring control efforts, and enforcing the regulation and movement of goods. So we used uh, two database systems, including Canadensis, which covers the whole country of Canada. Um, so this can be searched by using specific species to find out the current recordings. And we also used EDD maps, with this, which is mostly used in the United States, although it does have some information for both Ontario and Quebec. All right, so the first species we looked at in detail was purple loosestrife, or Lithrum salicaria. And it utilizes both the floodplain and emergent plant communities, and can utilize a lot of sh shorelines of lakes, rivers, as well as disturbed roadways and drainage systems. Some threats it poses include monoculture growth, uh, alteration to the nutrients in the environment, competition with native species, as well as a reduction of wetland bird species, such as the pied-billed grebe or the least bittern. The current locations that we found it include Maine, Quebec, and New Brunswick on the databases that we used. And the pathways we've identified include disturbed roadways, ditch and drainage systems, as well as the movement by both humans and animals. The removal options here include pulling and mowing at the least, effort, the least amount of effort, Second option includes both mechanical and chemical usage. And the third degree would be a higher usage of both mechanical and herbicide applications. So common reed or Phragmites australis. 
Um, it utilizes both disturbed to pristine wetland areas, so it uses a large range of habitat types, and it can also be fo found similarly to purple loosestrife in the lake, or shorelines of lakes, ponds, and waterways, as well as roadways and ditches. Some threats that it poses include monoculture growth, the same as purple loosestrife. Uh, it also poses heavy com competition with natives and an unnatural alteration to hydrology in new habitats. The current locations we've found it include Maine, Quebec, Nova Scotia, and PEI. And the pathways we've identified include disturbed roadways and highways, the spread through rhizomes, as well as drainage systems. The removal options, for example, here include cutting, mowing, and mechanical efforts. The next degree would be cutting, mowing, as well as some herbicide usage. And the highest degree would be a combination, combination of those, as well as planting natives after chemical usage to deter the reestablishment of the species. So the insect we decided was the highest risk, risk to the PNA was the brown spruce longhorn beetle, or tetro, Tetropium thuscum. And some threats that it poses include the destruction and eventual death of red, white, black, and Norway spruce. The current locations where it's found include Nova Scotia, which is currently considered fully infested by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. And the CFIA has also reported two detections in New Brunswick. The pathways it utilizes are just spread through natural flight patterns, as well as the movement of spruce wood products by humans, especially firewood. Current efforts in infested areas include uh, creating containment areas, regulation on the movement of wood, as well as a lot of educational materials. So the first goal I'd like to go into is identifying the pathways and areas of risk for these species. So this was our original uh, invasive species protocol for risk analysis. And we thought it would be still useful to include this as we've only gone in detail in a few species. So in these areas, the floodplain and emergent would be some of the highest risk due to the high hyd hydrological features within the PNA. And these areas are also associated with access roads, boat access areas, as well as the active shorelines. So these would be areas likely introducing uh, species by humans. So for purple loosestrife, we've identified a low to moderate risk. And this is based on the re available recorded data, although it is nearby in New Brunswick, despite some of the databases uh, reportings. Um, so we've identified three areas of risk, and this is based upon the use of drainage system by the seeds of the species. So we've identified three areas in which an access road intersects or is located nearby to a waterway, as well as a topographical decline of at least 40 meters entering the PNA. So this would be prime areas for seeds to drain into the PNA and become established. For common reed, we've identified a moderate to high risk based on the nearby locations as well as the viable pathways and the high habitat alteration ability that it does have. So as you can see, this is an example from the Canadensis database, and there have been high concentrations of recordings in Montreal. And as you can see, there are dispersing populations that lead along the highways up toward Quebec City and up toward Riviere de Loup as well. And Purple Loosestrife does follow a similar pathway. For spru or brown spruce longhorn beetle, um, we decided it was a moderate threat based upon the nearby location of Nova Scotia and the pathways that it uses. Um, it is a moderate risk to the PNA due to the high uh, percentage of stands of both balsam fir and spruce, which are shown on green, greenish yellow there on the map. And so uh, this would be easily uh, spread throughout the PNA using these stands, which would create a higher risk. So the next goal we're going to go over is implementing monitoring and control efforts. So we have several degrees of monitoring options, the first of which would be observational efforts and limited, limited monitoring along the PNA border. The next would be integration of invasive recordings, moderate monitoring, especially along the risk areas identified, as well as periodic monitoring efforts, such as yearly. The next option would be full-time trained staff for monitoring and a focus on both the border and high usage and risk areas. So for purple loosestrife, we've chosen option A, as well as removal efforts of just mechanical and cutting. Uh, for common reed, we've chosen option B for monitoring, and we'd like to utilize both the usage of mechanical and chemical efforts, or also planting native species. Glossy buckthorn, we've chosen option B, as well as just cutting and mowing for mechanical efforts. And garlic mustard, option A, as well as cutting and mowing and cutting off flower heads. 
So next would be enforcing regulation and movement of goods. So monitoring efforts for insects are a bit different than the plants, and we go from observational efforts and low monitoring efforts. The next option would be a monitoring, monitoring effort, as well as some limited usage of traps along the border, such as fair mode trapping, as well as random stops of vehicles within the PNA. The next option would be high monitoring efforts, high trapping, as well as mandatory stops entering the PNA from the highest traffic points. So for Emerald Ash Borer, we've chosen only option one, and the reason for this is that currently at this time there have been no ash species identified within the PNA. Although as time goes on, there will be a, bi a bio blitz, which will be inventorying the species within the area. So if something new is found, we can revisit this option and possibly do a higher effort. And brown, sp brown spruce long beetle, we've chosen option two, uh, mostly due to the nearby locations of it and the fact that we do have such a high abundance of spruce stands within the PNA. And the last goal we have is implementing educational programs. So one example of this would be the New Brunswick Invasive Species Field Guide, which if you're interested, you can pick up a copy after we're done our presentation here. Um, some other examples would be educational signage, and this could be as shown at, on the right, which would be a, uh, a fact sheet overseeing a lot of the information on the insect as well as the threats that it poses. Or we can go directly into the anthropogenic causes, which would be the movement of firewood, and focus signage on uh, educating the PNA users on this risk. So now I'll pass it off to Cody to go on to fire. All right, so I'm going to switch gears a little, a little bit here and start talking about fire protocol within the PNA. Um, so currently within New Brunswick, the fire protocol is to uh, extinguish fires upon discovery. And what this has done is it has affected the natural process of the fire regime within the province. But again, specifically, we're talking about within the PNA. Um, and this is especially true for white pine. Um, within the PNA, we currently only have 35.5 hectares of pure white pine stands. That's of the 26,000 hectares present overall. Um, and Spenick is especially affected by this because prior to its designation as a PNA in 2003, it was managed by Georgia Pacific, uh, a forestry company, which uh, did some extensive logging and removed even more uh, white pine from the air. So the 35.5 hectares we have within it, we feel are important to conserve. Um, so we've identified three potential threats uh, surrounding fire. So the lowering of biodiversity, large scale, file, large scale fire events, and a representation of non-historic forest cover in the area. Um, and we have three goals for dealing with this. So that's increasing the biodiversity and restore altered habitats, uh, reduce the potential intensity of large-scale fires, and restore and reinforce the historical regime that would have been present. Um, so we kind of have a one-size-fits-all solution for those three threats, and that is prescribed burns. Now, we're not looking to do a prescribed burn on a large scale or a large area. We're looking to go in and mechanically do an understory burn, take out the coarse woody debris, um, vegetation cover on the forest floor, and uh, remove uh, fuel buildup and the organic layer that would be present. Uh, behind me there on the slide is just a rundown of each step through a prescribed burn. Um, but again, small scale and mechanically done. Um, so how does this help biodiversity? So what it does is it increases the nutrient input and seed production of the white pine in these areas. Um, so what it, uh, their growth and reproduction is increased as an influx of nutrients come in from the burn. So what we're doing is uh, as we burn out that coarse wood debris, the plant matter that's there and the organic layer, that leaches into the soil. The white pine is now able to take that up and it can increase seed production of the white pine by up to 50%. Um, there's no longer any competition for the white pine in the understory. So these new seeds coming down are able to come up uninhibited by competition. Uh, it also provides food and habitat for other wildlife. Uh, within the PNA, we have a species of least concern and a threatened species. And I'm going to start with our species of least concern, which is the black backed woodpecker. Uh, they're found more commonly in burnt areas. It's habitat that they enjoy, and you find more mating pairs in those areas. Uh, the openness of these freshly burnt areas provides foraging opportunities for them, uh, as well as uh, the snags left behind after a prescribed burn offer nesting opportunities. We also have the olive sided flycatcher, which is a songbird. Uh, it's listed as threatened. Uh, and we have that within the PNA. Um, it benefits from everything that the black backed woodpecker would, uh, but it also uses uh, the fresh perching areas in the understory uh, for mating and, and songs. Um, it also offers uh, foraging habitat for deer uh, and just the general mosaic uh, by having these open areas increases diversity of habitat available within the PNA, which overall increases the biodiversity. 
Uh, so looking at large scale fires, uh, we've identified these white pine stands as an area of risk. Um, the amount of fuel buildup under white pine is more so than under other conifer species. It also has an easy or time catching fire. So the amount of litter output from the white pine is excessive in compared to other conifer species. Also the sap that white pine produces uh, is flammable. So because of this, uh, we think that these areas would benefit from prescribed burn because it reduces the amount of risk associated with fire, either from a human induced or from a natural event such as a lightning strike. Um, and reducing the risk in these small areas reduces risk to the overall area. So if we don't have these three areas at high risk, the overall PNA is more protected because of that. Uh, finally, looking at uh, restoring historical regime. So New Brunswick forests uh, historically were white pine co-dominant or at the very least had much more white pine in it than we see now. Um, what these prescribed burns are going to do, it's going to help us maintain these white pine stands that we have within the PNA. Uh, we're not looking at setting up an intensive silviculture program, but the white pine stands that we do have there, we want to preserve. And this prescribed burn is going to help that nutrient intake, help these white pine compete with general species such as spruce and fir, and help maintain those stands that we do have. And that sums up fire, and I'm going to do a conclusion here for the whole thing. So we were the Spednik Lake Strategic Management Plan. Um, we worked with ERD this year to come up with some enhancements to their draft. And we did that by going through their goals of minimizing human-induced impacts. And for water, we looked at uh, maintaining water quality, maintaining the water levels within the PNA, and mitigating the risk of watercraft and introducing invasives into the area. We looked at restoring altered habitats. Uh, with invasives, we looked at taking out invasives that may be in the area. Um, and we looked at maintaining the white pine that's in the area. So maybe not restoring, but making sure it's not further altered. And for minimizing the impacts of potential large-scale disturbances, uh, with invasives, we looked at mitigating the risk of introducing any insect species. And within fire, we looked at mitigating the risk of any large-scale fires in the area. Um, before we conclude, I'd just like to give some acknowledgments to our course administrators, uh, Brian Sargent and Dr. Ted Neiman. You guys have been great support throughout the year, and we really do appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Graham Forbes, uh, he was uh, part of the program that is, uh, placed the PNAs, and he has been a great asset for us. Frank Carroll, who couldn't be here tonight, he's the former mayor of McAdam, and he gave us a fair bit of history on the PNA in general. And a special thanks to the Department of Energy and Resource Development, especially Munich Bourgeois, and uh, Martin Marshall, who got to also not be here tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs>